You're watching Euronews Now. I'm Anka Ula. Thanks for joining us on the show. Let's take a look at our top stories this Monday, June 13th. Ukraine Severodonetsk under siege as Russian forces destroyed the second of three bridges out of the city, cutting civilians off from a potential escape route. The first round of France's legislative elections leaves President Macron's party scrambling as a left-wing coalition threatens the ruling party's majority. And Cyprus launches a bid to attract more European tourists as Russian visitors who propped up the industry are banned from traveling there. Russian forces are continuing to bombard the eastern Ukrainian city of Severodonetsk. Attacks on infrastructure have destroyed a bridge linking the city to neighboring Lyschansk, which observers say could prevent the evacuation of many civilians. Russia's also destroyed a power station in Donetsk, where they've taken control of the city of Svitsladarsk. On the Mykolaiv front, Ukrainian troops hold out against the onslaught. Kyiv claims Russia has lost some 40,000 soldiers since the start of the war. Meanwhile, on the diplomatic front, Turkey has again announced new efforts to restart stalled negotiations between Ukraine and Russia. Repercussions beyond the region continue, especially over food supplies. A grain terminal in Mykolaiv has been destroyed, and there are no signs of a lifting of the blockade of Black Sea ports. On Sunday, Russia celebrated its national day, unfurling dozens of flags in the devastated southern city of Mariupol, one of the areas where it's already handed out Russian passports as part of a campaign of Russification. The day was also celebrated in the annexed region of Crimea, where at least the only explosions were of fireworks rather than bombs. A feeling of victory for the left in the first round of the French parliamentary elections. The country's left-wing alliance, led by Jean-Luc Mélenchon, was neck-to-neck -neck with newly re-elected President Emmanuel Macron's party. It is emerging as the main opposition force. The truth is that the presidential party was defeated at the end of the first round. For the first time in the history of the Fifth Republic, a newly elected president is not capable of gathering a majority in the following parliamentary election. À réunir une majorité à l'élection législative qui suit. However, barring a major surprise, the president will still obtain a majority in the second round, but with fewer seats than five years ago, and with this absolute majority in danger. The country's prime minister called for support in the coming days, saying, Nous avons une semaine de We have one week to mobilize ahead of us. One week to convince, one week to obtain a strong and clear majority. Only this strong and clear majority will allow us to respond to the urgent needs that weigh on the daily lives of the French and to meet the challenges of the future. Next Sunday, in the face of the extremes, by voting for the candidates of the presidential majority, it will allow France to meet its future and its values. The far-right candidate Marie Le Pen failed to attract the same votes that took her party to the second round of the presidential election. In response, Le Pen called on people not to vote for either Macron or Mélenchon in the second round. In a speech, she said that in the places where the second round will be a duel between Macron's party and the left-wing coalition, I invite voters not to choose between the destroyers from above and the destroyers from below, not to choose between those who want to deprive you of your rights and those who want to deprive you of your property. Abstention has played a major part in this election, exceeding 52 percent, a record for the Fifth Republic. The goal of many of the candidates in the coming days will be to mobilize those who stay at home during the first round.
It's been less than two months since Emmanuel Macron was re-elected president of France, but now he's fighting to retain his parliamentary majority in legislative elections which are now being held across the country. Macron desperately needs a parliamentary majority if he's to continue driving forward his business-friendly economic reforms, including raising the retirement age and overhauling the welfare system. System. And if Mr. Mélenchon's bloc emerges with the largest number of seats in Parliament, that could force President Macron to name Mr. Mélenchon Prime Minister. That would be a very difficult situation for the President and it could effectively paralyse government in France for the next five years. So everything to play for and we can expect some very intense campaigning this week. In third place yesterday came the far-right party headed by Marine Le Pen who was uh, Mr Macron's main challenger in the presidential election in April. Turnout yesterday sank to a record low. Only 47% of registered voters cast ballots. It was beautiful sunny weather and a lot of people seemed to prefer to spend their time outdoors rather than going to polling stations. So uh, Mr Macron and Mr Mélenchon will be trying to turn that round this week. David Chazan in Paris for Euronews. Sunday was a good night for Italy's right-leaning parties. Both the country's conservative Forza Italia and its far-right Brothers of Italy party won regional elections in Genoa and Palermo, according to exit polls. Around 9 million Italians were eligible to vote for mayors in almost 1,000 towns and cities. And the election was a major test for lawmakers before the parliamentary elections early next year. Brothers of Italy has been steadily gaining support over the past five years. In 2018, the party, which has neo-fascist origins, polled at around 4% of the vote. But just before the election, it polled at 22%. People were also eligible to vote for five referendums on justice reforms. However, the referendums require 50% turnout to be valid, and only around 20% of people showed up to vote for the measures. Later on today, the British government will introduce new legislation in the House of Commons in London to override parts of the Northern Ireland Protocol, part of the EU Brexit Agreement. Now, the protocol was designed to stop the UK reneging on the Good Friday Agreement. That peace agreement, stuck in the late 1990s, says that there can be no hard border between the Republic and Northern Ireland. In order to do this, it meant that Northern Ireland, unlike the rest of the UK, stayed in the EU single market. It, and that meant there had to be an Irish sea border. So goods which come from England, Wales and Scotland have to face customs checks when they get to ports in Northern Ireland. Now this was a compromise but it was one that the loyalist community and their political parties are very unhappy with. The DUP, the biggest unionist party, are currently refusing to go back into government in Northern Ireland because of this. So the British government is trying to unilaterally override parts of it, saying that these customs checks don't need to be carried out. The opposition to this, though, is coming in strongly from the Republic of Ireland government, from the EU and from the US as well. But the British government is adamant that what they're doing is legal because they say the system just isn't working. Vincent McAvinney, Euronews, London. Historians in the UK have made public the 2007 discovery of the wreck of a ship that sank in 1682 while carrying a future king. The HMS Gloucester ran aground near Great Yarmouth off the eastern English coast. Most of the crew and passengers were killed, but the future King James II of England and Ireland survived. He also went on to be King James VII of Scotland.